The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo, Book 21, Chapter 15. Nevertheless, in the heavy yoke that is laid upon the sons of Adam from the day that they go out of their mother's womb to the day that they return to the mother of all things, there is found an admirable though painful monitor teaching us to be sober-minded, and convincing us that this life has become penal in consequence of that outrageous wickedness which was perpetrated in paradise, and that all to which the New Testament invites belongs to that future inheritance which awaits us in the world to come come, and is offered for our acceptance, as the earnest that we may, in its own due time, obtain that of which it is the pledge. Now, therefore, let us walk in hope, and let us by the Spirit mortify the deeds of the flesh, and so make progress from day to day. For the Lord knoweth them that are his, and as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, but by grace, not by nature." For there is but one Son of God by nature, who in his compassion became Son of Man for our sakes, that we, by nature sons of men, might by grace become through him sons of God. For he, abiding unchangeable, took upon him our nature, that thereby he might take us to himself. And, holding fast his own divinity, he became partaker of our infirmity, that we, being changed into some better thing, might, by participating in his righteousness and immortality, lose our own properties of sin and mortality, and preserve whatever good quality he had implanted in our nature, perfected now by sharing in the goodness of his nature. For as by the sin of one man we have fallen into a misery so deplorable, so by the righteousness of one man, who also is God, shall we come to a blessedness inconceivably exalted. Nor ought any one to trust that he has passed from the one man to the other, until he shall have reached that place where there is no temptation, and have entered into the peace which he seeks in the many and various conflicts of this war, in which the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Now such a war as this would have had no existence if human nature had, in the exercise of free will, continued steadfast in the uprightness in which it was created. But now in its misery it makes war upon itself, because in its blessedness it would not continue at peace with God. And this, though it be a miserable calamity, is better than the earlier stages of this life, which do not recognize that a war is to be maintained." For better is it to contend with vices, than without conflict to be subdued by them. Better, I say, is war with the hope of peace everlasting, than captivity without any thought of deliverance. We long, indeed, for the cessation of this war, and, kindled by the flame of divine love, we burn for entrance on that well-ordered peace, in which whatever is inferior is forever subordinated to what is above it. But if, which God forbid, there had been no hope of so blessed a consummation, we should still have preferred to endure the hardness of this conflict, rather than, by our non-resistance, to yield ourselves to the dominion of vice. CHAPTER sixteen. But such is God's mercy towards the vessels of mercy which he has prepared for glory, that even the first age of man, that is, infancy, which submits without any resistance to the flesh, and the second age, which is called boyhood, and which has not yet understanding enough to undertake this warfare, and therefore yields to almost every vicious pleasure, because, though this age has the power of speech, and may therefore seem to have passed infancy, the mind is still too weak to comprehend the commandment. Yet if either of these ages has received the sacraments of the Mediator, then, although the present life be immediately brought to an end, the child, having been translated from the power of darkness to the kingdom of Christ, shall not only be saved from eternal punishments, but shall not even suffer purgatorial torments after death. For spiritual regeneration of itself suffices to prevent any evil consequences resulting after death from the connection with death which carnal generation forms. 
but when we reach that age which can now comprehend the commandment, and submit to the dominion of law, we must declare war upon vices, and wage this war keenly, lest we be landed in damnable sins. And if vices have not gathered strength by habitual victory, they are more easily overcome and subdued. But if they have been used to conquer and rule, it is only with difficulty and labor they are mastered. And indeed this victory cannot be sincerely and truly gained, but by delighting in true righteousness, and it is faith in Christ that gives this. For if the law be present with its command, and the spirit be absent with his help, the presence of the prohibition serves only to increase the desire to sin, and adds the guilt of transgression. Sometimes, indeed, patent vices are overcome by other and hidden vices, which are reckoned virtues, though pride and a kind of ruinous self-sufficiency are their informing principles. Accordingly, vices are then only to be considered overcome when they are conquered by the love of God, which God himself alone gives, and which he gives only through the mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who became a partaker of our mortality, that he might make us partakers of his divinity. But few indeed are they who are so happy as to have passed their youth without committing any damnable sins, either by dissolute or violent conduct, or by following some godless and unlawful opinions, but have subdued by their greatness of soul everything in them which could make them the slaves of carnal pleasures. The greater number, having first become transgressors of the law that they have received, and having allowed vice to have the ascendancy in them, then flee to grace for help, and so, by a penitence more bitter, and a struggle more violent than it would otherwise have been, they subdue the soul to God, and thus give it its lawful authority over the flesh, and become victors. Whoever, therefore, desires to escape eternal punishment, let him not only be baptized, but also justified in Christ, and so let him in truth pass from the devil to Christ. And let him not fancy that there are any purgatorial pains, except before that final and dreadful judgment. We must not, however, deny that even the eternal fire will be proportioned to the deserts of the wicked, so that to some it will be more, and to others less painful, whether this result be accomplished by a variation in the temperature of the fire itself, graduated according to every one's merit, or whether it be that the heat remains the same, but that all do not feel it with equal intensity of torment. CHAPTER Seventeen. I must now, I see, enter the lists of amicable controversy with those tender-hearted Christians who decline to believe that any, or that all, of those whom the infallibly just judge may pronounce worthy of the punishment of hell, shall suffer eternally, and who suppose that they shall be delivered after a fixed term of punishment, longer or shorter, according to the amount of each man's sin. In respect of this matter, Origen was even more indulgent, for he believed that even the devil himself and his angels, after suffering those more severe and prolonged pains which their sins deserved, should be delivered from their torments and associated with the holy angels. But the church, not without reason, condemned him for this and other errors, especially for his theory of the ceaseless alternation of happiness and misery, and the interminable transitions from the one state to the other at fixed periods of ages. For in this theory he lost even the credit of being merciful, by allotting to the saints real miseries for the expiation of their sins, and false happiness, which brought them no true and secure joy, that is, is no fearless assurance of eternal blessedness. Very different, however, is the error we speak of which is dictated by the tenderness of these Christians, who suppose that the sufferings of those who are condemned in the judgment will be temporary, while the blessedness of all who are sooner or later set free will be eternal. Which opinion, if it is good and true because it is merciful, will be so much the better and truer in proportion as it becomes more merciful? 
Let then this fountain of mercy be extended, and flow forth even to the lost angels, and let them also be set free, at least after as many and long ages as seem fit. Why does this stream of mercy flow to all the human race, and dry up as soon as it reaches the angelic? And yet they dare not extend their pity further, and propose the deliverance of the devil himself. Or, if any one is bold enough to do so, he does indeed put to shame their charity, but is himself convicted of error that is more unsightly, and arresting of God's truth that is more perverse, in proportion as his clemency of sentiment seems to be greater. CHAPTER Eighteen. There are others, again, with whose opinions I have become acquainted in conversation, who, though they seem to reverence the holy scriptures, are yet of reprehensible life, and who, accordingly, in their own interest, attribute to God a still greater compassion towards men. For they acknowledge that it is truly predicted in the divine word that the wicked and unbelieving are worthy of punishment, but they assert that when the judgment comes, mercy will prevail. For, say they, God, having compassion on them, will give them up to the prayers and intercessions of his saints. For if the saints used to pray for them when they suffered from their cruel hatred, how much more will they do so when they see them prostrate and humble suppliants? For we cannot, they say, believe that the saints shall lose their bowels of compassion when they have attained the most perfect and complete holiness, so that they who, when still sinners, prayed for their enemies, should now, when they are freed from sin, withhold from interceding for their suppliants. Or shall God refuse to listen to so many of his beloved children, when their holiness has purged their prayers of all hindrance to his answering them? and the passage of the psalm which is cited by those who admit that wicked men and infidels shall be punished for a long time, though in the end delivered from all sufferings, is claimed also by the persons we are now speaking of as making much more for them. The verse runs, Shall God forget to be gracious? Shall he in anger shut up his tender mercies? His anger, they say, would condemn all that are unworthy of everlasting happiness to endless punishment, but if he suffer them to be punished for a long time, or even at all, must he not shut up his tender mercies, which the psalmist implies he will not do? For he does not say, Shall he in anger shut up his tender mercies for a long period? But he implies that he will not shut them up at all and they deny that thus God's threat of judgment is proved to be false, even though he condemn no man, any more than we can say that his threat to overthrow Nineveh was false, though the destruction which was absolutely predicted was not accomplished. For he did not say, Nineveh shall be overthrown if they do not repent and amend their ways, but without any such condition he foretold that the city should be overthrown. And this prediction, they maintain, was true because God predicted the punishment which they deserved, although he was not to inflict it. For though he spared them on their repentance, yet he was certainly aware that they would repent, and, notwithstanding, absolutely and definitely predicted that the city should be overthrown. This was true, they say, in the truth of severity, because they were worthy of it, but in respect of the compassion which checked his anger, so that he spared the suppliants from the punishment with which he had threatened the rebellious, it was not true. If, then, he spared those whom his own holy prophet was provoked at his sparing, how much more shall he spare those more wretched suppliants, for whom all his saints shall intercede? And they suppose that this conjecture of theirs is not hinted at in Scripture for the sake of stimulating many to reformation of life through fear of very protracted or eternal sufferings, and of stimulating others to pray for those who have not reformed. However, they think that the divine oracles are not altogether silent on this point, for they ask to what purpose is it said, How great is thy goodness which thou hast hidden for them that fear thee! if it be not to teach us that the great and hidden sweetness of God's mercy is concealed in order that men may fear. 
To the same purpose they think the apostles said, For God hath concluded all men in unbelief, that he may have mercy upon all, signifying that no one should be condemned by God. And yet they who hold this opinion do not extend it to the acquittal or liberation of the devil and his angels. Their human tenderness is moved only towards men, and they plead chiefly their own cause, holding out false hopes of impunity to their own depraved lives, by means of this quasi-compassion of God, to the whole race. Consequently, they who promise this impunity even to the prince of the devils and his satellites make a still fuller exhibition of the mercy of God. Chapter 19 so, too, there are others who promise this deliverance from eternal punishment not indeed to all men, but only to those who have been washed in Christian baptism, and who become partakers of the body of Christ, no matter how they have lived, or what heresy or impiety they have fallen into. They ground this opinion on the saying of Jesus, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that if any man eat thereof, he shall not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If a man eat of this bread, he shall live for ever. Therefore, say they, it follows that these persons must be delivered from death eternal, and at one time or other be introduced to everlasting life. CHAPTER Twenty. There are others still who make this promise not even to all who have received the sacraments of the baptism of Christ and of his body, but only to the Catholics, however badly they have lived. For these have eaten the body of Christ not only sacramentally, but really, being incorporated in his body, as the Apostle says, We, being many, are one bread, one body so that, though they have afterwards lapsed into some heresy, or even into heathenism and idolatry, yet by virtue of this one thing, that they have received the baptism of Christ, and eaten the body of Christ, in the body of Christ, that is to say, in the Catholic Church, they shall not die eternally, but at one time or other obtain eternal life, and all that wickedness of theirs shall not avail to make their punishment eternal, but only proportionately long and severe. Chapter 21 There are some, too, who found upon the expression of Scripture, He that endureth to the end shall be saved, and who promise salvation only to those who continue in the church Catholic, and though such persons have lived badly, yet, say they, they shall be saved as by fire through virtue of the foundation, of which the apostle says, For other foundation hath no man laid than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day of the Lord shall declare it, for it shall be revealed by fire, and each man's work shall be proved of what sort it is. If any man's work shall endure which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire." They say accordingly that the Catholic Christian, no matter what his life be, has Christ as his foundation, while this foundation is not possessed by any heresy which is separated from the unity of his body. And therefore, through virtue of this foundation, even though the Catholic Christian, by the inconsistency of his life, has been as one building up wood, hay, stubble, upon it, they believe that he shall be saved by fire, in other words, that he shall be delivered after tasting the pain of that fire, to which the wicked shall be condemned at the last judgment. Chapter 22 I have also met with some who are of opinion that such only as neglect to cover their sins with alms deeds shall be punished in everlasting fire, and they cite the words of the Apostle James, He shall have judgment without mercy who hath shown no mercy. 
Therefore, say they, he who has not amended his ways, but yet has intermingled his profligate and wicked actions with works of mercy, shall receive mercy in the judgment, so that he shall either quite escape condemnation, or shall be liberated from his doom after some time shorter or longer. They supposed that this was the reason why the judge himself, of quick and dead, declined to mention anything else than works of mercy done or omitted, when awarding to those on his right hand life eternal, and to those on his left everlasting punishment. To the same purpose, they say, is the daily petition we make in the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. For no doubt whoever pardons the person who has wronged him does a charitable action. And this has been so highly commended by the Lord himself, that he says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so it is to this kind of alms-deeds that the saying of the Apostle James refers, He shall have judgment without mercy, that hath shown no mercy. And our Lord, they say, made no distinction of great and small sins, but your Father will forgive your sins, if ye forgive men theirs. Consequently, they conclude, that though a man has led an abandoned life up to the last day of it, yet whatsoever his sins have been, they are all remitted by virtue of this daily prayer, if only he has been mindful to attend to this one thing, that when they who have done him any injury ask his pardon, he forgive them from his heart. When by God's help I have replied to all these errors, I shall conclude this twenty-first book. Chapter 23. First of all, it behooves us to inquire and to recognize why the Church has not been able to tolerate the idea that promises cleansing or indulgence to the devil even after the most severe and protracted punishment. For so many holy men, imbued with the spirit of the Old and New Testament, did not grudge to angels of any rank or character that they should enjoy the blessedness of the heavenly kingdom after being cleansed by suffering, but rather they perceived that they could not invalidate nor evacuate the divine sentence which the Lord predicted that he would pronounce in the judgment, saying, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For here it is evident that the devil and his angels shall burn in everlasting fire. And there is also that declaration in the Apocalypse, The devil their deceiver was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where also are the beast and the false prophet, and they shall be tormented day and night for ever. In the former passage everlasting is used, in the latter for ever, and by these words scripture is wont to mean nothing else than endless duration. And therefore no other reason, no reason more obvious and just, can be found for holding it as the fixed and immovable belief of the truest piety that the devil and his angels shall never return to the justice and life of the saints, than that scripture, which deceives no man, says that God spared them not, and that they were condemned beforehand by him, and cast into prisons of darkness in hell, being reserved to the judgment of the last day, when eternal fire shall receive them, in which they shall be tormented, world without end. And if this be so, how can it be believed that all men, or even some, shall be withdrawn from the endurance of punishment after some time has been spent in it? How can this be believed without enervating our faith in the eternal punishment of the devils? For if all, or some of those, to whom it shall be said, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, are not to be always in that fire, then what reason is there for believing that the devil and his angels shall always be there? Or is perhaps the sentence of God, which is to be pronounced on wicked men and angels alike, to be true in the case of the angels, false in that of men? Plainly, it will be so, if the conjectures of men are to weigh more than the word of God. 
but because this is absurd, they who desire to be rid of eternal punishment ought to abstain from arguing against God, and rather, while yet there is opportunity, obey the divine commands. Then what a fond fancy is it to suppose that eternal punishment means long-continued punishment, while eternal life means life without end, since Christ in the very same passage spoke of both in similar terms in one and the same sentence, These shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. If both destinies are eternal, then we must either understand both as long continued, but at last terminating, or both as endless. For they are correlative, on the one hand punishment eternal, on the other hand life eternal. And to say in one and the same sense life eternal shall be endless, punishment eternal shall come to an end, is the height of absurdity. Wherefore, as the eternal life of the saints shall be endless, so too the eternal punishment of those who are doomed to it shall have no end. Chapter 24 And this reasoning is equally conclusive against those who, in their own interest, but under the guise of a greater tenderness of spirit, attempt to invalidate the words of God, and who assert that these words are true, not because men shall suffer those things which are threatened by God, but because they deserve to suffer them. For God, they say, will yield them to the prayers of his saints, who will then the more earnestly pray for their enemies, as they shall be more perfect in holiness, and whose prayers will be the more efficacious, and the more worthy of God's ear, because now purged from all sin whatsoever. Why, then, if in that perfected holiness their prayers be so pure and all-availing, will they not use them in behalf of the angels for whom eternal fire is prepared, that God may mitigate his sentence, and alter it, and extricate them from that fire? Or will there perhaps be some one hardy enough to affirm that even the holy angels will make common cause with holy men, then become the equals of God's angels, and will intercede for the guilty, both men and angels, that mercy may spare them the punishment which truth has pronounced them to deserve. But this has been asserted by no one sound in the faith, nor will be. Otherwise there is no reason why the church should not even now pray for the devil and his angels, since God her master has ordered her to pray for her enemies. The reason, then, which prevents the church from now praying for the wicked angels, whom she knows to be her enemies, is the identical reason which shall prevent her, however perfected in holiness, from praying at the last judgment for those men who are to be punished in eternal fire. At present she prays for her enemies among men, because they have yet opportunity for fruitful repentance. For what does she especially beg for them, but that God would grant them repentance, as the Apostle says, that they may return to soberness out of the snare of the devil, by whom they are held captive according to his will? But if the church were certified who those are, who, though they are still abiding in this life, are yet predestinated to go with the devil into eternal fire, then for them she could no more pray than for him. But since she has this certainty regarding no man, she prays for all her enemies who yet live in this world, and yet she is not heard in behalf of all. But she is heard in the case of those only who, though they oppose the church, are yet predestinated to become her sons through her intercession. But if any retain an impenitent heart until death, and are not converted from enemies into sons, does the church continue to pray for them, for the spirits, that is, of such persons deceased? And why does she cease to pray for them, unless because the man who was not translated into Christ's kingdom while he was in the body is now judged to be of Satan's following? It is then, I say, the same reason which prevents the church at any time from praying for the wicked angels, which prevents her from praying hereafter for those men who are to be punished in eternal fire. And this also is the reason why, though she prays even for the wicked so long as they live, she yet does not, even in this world, pray for the unbelieving and godless who are dead. 
For some of the dead, indeed, the prayer of the church or of pious individuals is heard, but it is for those who, having been regenerated in Christ, did not spend their life so wickedly that they can be judged unworthy of such compassion, nor so well that they can be considered to have no need of it. As also, after the resurrection, there will be some of the dead, to whom, after they have endured the pains proper to the spirits of the dead, mercy shall be accorded, an acquittal from the punishment of the eternal fire. For were there not some whose sins, though not remitted in this life, shall be remitted in that which is to come, it could not be truly said, they shall not be forgiven, neither in this world, neither in that which is to come. But when the judge of quick and dead has said, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, and to those on the other side, Depart from me, ye cursed, into the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels, and these shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It were excessively presumptuous to say that the punishment of any of those whom God has said shall go away into eternal punishment shall not be eternal, and so bring either despair or doubt upon the corresponding promise of life eternal. Let no man then so understand the words of the psalmist, Shall God forget to be gracious? Shall he shut up in his anger his tender mercies, as if the sentence of God were true of good men, false of bad men, or true of good men and wicked angels, but false of bad men? For the psalmist's words refer to the vessels of mercy and the children of the promise, of whom the prophet himself was one. For when he had said, Shall God forget to be gracious, shall he shut up in his anger his tender mercies, and then immediately subjoins, And I said, Now I begin, this is the change wrought by the right hand of the Most High. He manifestly explained what he meant by the words, Shall he shut up in his anger his tender mercies. For God's anger is this mortal life, in which man is made like to vanity, and his days pass as a shadow. Yet in this anger God does not forget to be gracious, causing his sun to shine and his rain to descend on the just and the unjust, and thus he does not in his anger cut short his tender mercies, and especially in what the psalmist speaks of in the words, now I begin, this change is from the right hand of the Most High. For he changes for the better the vessels of mercy, even while they are still in this most wretched life, which is God's anger, and even while his anger is manifesting itself in this miserable corruption. For in his anger he does not shut up his tender mercies." And since the truth of this divine canticle is quite satisfied by this application of it, there is no need to give it a reference to that place in which those who do not belong to the city of God are punished in eternal fire. But if any persist in extending its application to the torments of the wicked, let them at least understand it, so that the anger of God, which has threatened the wicked with eternal punishment, shall abide, but shall be mixed with mercy to the extent of alleviating the torments which might justly be inflicted, so that the wicked shall neither wholly escape, nor only for a time endure these threatened pains, but that they shall be less severe and more endurable than they deserve. Thus the anger of God shall continue, and at the same time he will not, in this anger, shut up his tender mercies. But even this hypothesis I am not to be supposed to affirm, because I do not positively oppose it. As for those who find an empty threat rather than a truth in such passages as these, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, and these shall go away into eternal punishment, and they shall be tormented for ever and ever, and their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, 
Such persons, I say, are most emphatically and abundantly refuted, not by me so much as by the divine scripture itself. For the men of Nineveh repented in this life, and therefore their repentance was fruitful, inasmuch as they sowed in that field which the Lord meant to be sown in tears, that it might afterwards be reaped in joy. And yet who will deny that God's prediction was fulfilled in their case, if at least he observes that God destroys sinners not only in anger, but also in compassion? For sinners are destroyed in two ways. Either, like the Sodomites, the men themselves are punished for their sins, or, like the Ninevites, the men's sins are destroyed by repentance. God's prediction, therefore, was fulfilled. The wicked Nineveh was overthrown, and a good Nineveh built up. For its walls and houses remained standing, the city was overthrown in its depraved manners." And thus, though the prophet was provoked that the destruction which the inhabitants dreaded because of his prediction did not take place, yet that which God's foreknowledge had predicted did take place, for he who foretold the destruction knew how it should be fulfilled in a less calamitous sense. But that these perversely compassionate persons may see what is the purport of these words, how great is the abundance of thy sweetness, Lord, which thou hast hidden for them that fear thee. Let them read what follows, and thou hast perfected it for them that hope in thee. For what means thou hast hidden it for them that fear thee, thou hast perfected it for them that hope in thee, unless this, that to those who through fear of punishment seek to establish their own righteousness by the law, the righteousness of God is not sweet, because they are ignorant of it. They have not tasted it, for they hope in themselves, not in him, and therefore God's abundant sweetness is hidden from them. They fear God indeed, but it is with that servile fear which is not in love, for perfect love casteth out fear. Therefore to them that hope in him he perfecteth his sweetness, inspiring them with his own love, so that with a holy fear which love does not cast out, but which endureth for ever, they may, when they glory, glory in the Lord. For the righteousness of God is Christ, who is of God made unto us, as the Apostle says, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. As it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. This righteousness of God, which is the gift of grace without merits, is not known by those who go about to establish their own righteousness, and are therefore not subject to the righteousness of God, which is Christ. But it is in this righteousness that we find the great abundance of God's sweetness, of which the psalm says, Taste and see how sweet the Lord is. And this we rather taste than partake of to satiety, in this our pilgrimage. We hunger and thirst for it now, that hereafter we may be satisfied with it, when we see him as he is, and that is fulfilled which is written, I shall be satisfied when thy glory shall be manifested. It is thus that Christ perfects the great abundance of his sweetness to them that hope in him. But if God conceals his sweetness from them that fear him, in the sense that these are objectors fancy, so that men's ignorance of his purpose of mercy towards the wicked may lead them to fear him and live better, and so that there may be prayer made for those who are not living as they ought, how then does he perfect his sweetness to them that hope in him, since, if their dreams be true, it is this very sweetness which will prevent him from punishing those who do not hope in him? Let us then seek that sweetness of his which he perfects to them that hope in him, not that which he is supposed to perfect to those who despise and blaspheme him. For in vain, after this life, does a man seek for what he has neglected to provide while in this life. Then, as to that saying of the apostle, For God hath concluded all in unbelief, that he may have mercy upon all, it does not mean that he will condemn no one, but the foregoing context shows what is meant. 
the apostle composed the epistle for the Gentiles who were already believers, and when he was speaking to them of the Jews who were yet to believe, he says, For as ye in times past believed not God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. Then he added the words in question with which these persons beguile themselves. For God concluded all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. All whom, if not all those of whom he was speaking, just as if he had said, Both you and them. God then concluded all those in unbelief, both Jews and Gentiles, whom he foreknew and predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that they might be confounded by the bitterness of unbelief, and might repent, and believingly turn to the sweetness of God's mercy, and might take up that exclamation of the psalm, How great is the abundance of thy sweetness, O Lord, which thou hast hidden for them that fear thee, but hast perfected to them that hope, not in themselves, but in thee. He has mercy, then, on all the vessels of mercy. And what means all? Both those of the Gentiles and those of the Jews, whom he predestinated, called, justified, glorified, none of these will be condemned by him, but we cannot say, none of all men whatever. End of Book 21, Chapters 15-24 through 24.